the publisher for Acorn Press. And I want to thank you all for coming out today for the launch of uh, Rod, uh, Rod's new book, Here and There. I, don't, I left my copy at work, so I don't have it to show up, but I'm hoping that Rod will be able to show his copy. Uh, they are really just hot off the printers. Um, the printers are working a little slower than normal or not as reliable as normal, I guess, is the way to say it, because the book was supposed to be in a week or two ago, but we uh, didn't get them until Friday. So uh, they aren't even in stores yet, but they will start uh, appearing in stores next week. So if you want to get a copy, you'll be able to talk to the bookmark or Indigo or order it online from anybody who you normally online buy books from online. And uh, anyway, I just, this was a really uh, tough year for a lot of people. Uh, COVID has led to a lot of stress and a number of books that we were going to publish, we sort of delayed and I didn't really have a lot of faith in what the book market was going to be like back earlier in the year when I was trying to figure out what the rest of the year's books were going to be. But what I was thinking would, it would be nice to have something that was just a nice book about PEI that would be good for PEI Islanders, for PEI to be able, Islanders to be able to have at home and, uh, and just sort of be a nice, positive, gentle book. And, uh, I had this manuscript for a while. Roderick had sent it, I don't know, <laughs> maybe a year or more, two ago. And uh, Hugh McDonald is part of our sort of editorial review team. And he had really liked the manuscript and so made its way back up to the top of my pile. And I just thought this would be the, the perfect sort of antidote to this year. And luckily we got it out in time. And uh, I hope that you will all like it. It's the poetry is wonderful. They're evocative of another time. We were trying to hope, hope with the book to make it look and feel like a classic book from another time, almost like you're reading a book from, you know, that was done with letterpress kind of printing and everything. Uh, that was really what I was hoping for. So, um, but anyway, it just was Roderick, I just hope you know it was a lovely book to read and I hope that Islanders and anybody who loves PEI or just likes gentle poetry will feel the same way. Uh, but this is just a little aside. Um, my mom is not a big poetry reader and she uh, got the book yesterday because uh, she had to get it ready to get to be picked up by Roderick. Um, but she said, I really liked these poems. And to me, that was exactly what I was going for. I wanted to speak to anybody. The poems could be accessible and anyone, whether you, you know, think you're a poetry reader or not. Uh, and I think he feels the same way about this, but uh, he'll get into that too. But anyway, that was just the perfect sort of launch pad for me because it was, yes, that's, that's exactly what. I was hoping what happened and hope all of you will get a chance to have the same feeling. So I'm going to turn it over to Hugh now. Hugh did the editing um, for the book and uh, he is much closer to Rod and uh, I think he'll be able to, you know, get a dive a little deeper into the topic with you. So, but I'll jump in maybe sometimes too. So, Hugh, would you like to take over? Okay. Okay. Can you hear me, Rod? I can hear you, Hugh. Oh, that's good. That's all we need right now. Do you know what? Every time I read through some, and I've done it several times with just, the, you know, some of our manuscript stuff. Every time I read it, I just discover something more that I find really interesting. And certain things show through like crazy. And I think the big thing is, well, love, your love for people and the community you live in and everything around you, all of nature. Mm -hmm. And and um, your understanding of communities and how they work. Uh, honestly, um, you talk, you, one of your poems is called Sanctum Sanctorum, mm -hmm. which means oh, Holy of Holies. That's, you got a bit of Latin in there. 
Yeah, and and, it, and it, involves, it involves a walk to the beach, to the shore, and it yeah. deals with the walk and what's sort of around you. And everything you talk about from the, the old gentleman who fishes sitting on the edge of the wharf with the line in the water for years, apparently, and when he dies in his spot, they find out there's no hook on his well, line. Well, that was a spoiler, Hugh. Uh, well, that's okay. They're going to want to read that one three or four times because it's really quite beautiful. Thank you. Anyway, so, and then there, that was that guy. And then there was this person who you just totally exemplified what it's like to live in a sort of a moderately small community and have meet somebody on the street. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden something happens and they disappear and you wish you'd never gotten around to sort of introducing yourself and speaking to them. But that happens to all of us who live in small communities. That experience of meeting someone on a fairly regular basis or seeing someone in a particular place when we're driving by. Mm -hmm. But they're, and they become important to us, even if we've never spoken to them. I, I try to capture the small moments here. I think I, think I try to focus what, yeah. on them. And, and that's what you did. That's what you did. Um, tr a truck, truck, and a and an Amish buggy move. Right? <laughs> they meet. And they're, uh, headlines. Headlines in the Charlottetown Guardian. Headlines, absolutely. So that's the first time your community was in the headlines for, for a little while, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean your community isn't much more important than that one headline. Um, Carol, she was the passerby. All I know is her name. Mm -hmm. and that's all you need to know to understand what you're saying. And that's how you, you know, that's how you talk about all of this. It's it's all done sort of matter of factly, and it's filled with little, little, you know, skirts sort of blowing in the wind and little things that you notice about someone you care about, or someone that you love, or maybe even someone you're married to. I don't know. I'm not even sure who these people are, but I really, really like this book, and I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be popular. And I think it's going to do really well. And that's a rare thing for poetry books. So what else was I going to talk to you about? Oh, yeah. How many times do we look and go down to the cold room or wherever we store our jams and our pickles? And you look up and you see a jar of pickles. And it brings back the memory <laughs> of the day you picked the blueberries. And not, maybe you didn't even pick them. You were watching. I got I got a couple. No, fair, got fair a couple. I got a, I got a couple. You got a couple and you ate them and, and then you watched the other person pick them and you just admired her, her skill at picking in it. But you could still see the, the affection there for the place and the people. And that that's probably the key to so many of these things. You give lovely pictures of community activities like lobster fishing and oh all, all sorts of things that the natural you know, how much of the natural world is is open to you. Even even things like, you know, the things that those pangs that we all have in our hearts. The I'm supposed to be asking you questions, but I'm just gabbing. So pardon me and tell me to shut up. And anyway, you even you even I I, I sometimes suffer pangs when I when I have to kill a mosquito or something. Mm -hmm. And you you went way bigger than a mosquito. You murdered a mouse. And you and we can we all know the feeling when you've got a, you know, an invader in the house and you have to do something about it. And probably you like, like me, like I get, I get appointed as the executioner of, of invaders in the house. <laughs> that seems to me, but, but the feeling is there and that everything, everything that is here, you know, from the roses to the, to the mice, to the lobster fishery, uh, Oh my, and, and your use of language is just astonishing. You do such a beautiful job. A lot of poets now aren't used to working in rhyme, but you do it so easily, or at least appears easy. And it's well, flows Hugh, so I, Hugh, I, I, I love rhymed poetry myself as a reader and a listener, and I'm, I'm writing what I enjoy reading. Mm, yeah, well, that's good. That's what you should do. Uh, Anyway, I probably have talked long enough. So do you have anything you wanted to ask me? 
Good heavens, you put me on the spot now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, do you enjoy the process of editing? Yes, very Oops, much so. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah. And we didn't have to well, spend a lot. We didn't have to spend a lot of time because it was it, all very it was, good. To start it, it wasn't too onerous. No, not at all. It was fun. Do you, do you have a favorite poem you'd like to hear? Oh, yeah. Wait a second. Uh, let me see now. So many of them are beautiful. How about the how about the how about the incantation poem? Sure. It's like sort of the blessing. I call it the I call that your prayer, your your yes, blessings. A, you're the blessings from a contented soul. So that's right. Let me have a look at the So we can end we'll you and I will end this part of it with that poem. So that'll be perfect. As soon as I find it. I hear someone shouting from the other room. She may have the the uh, in the rain still in the cemetery. There's probably an index there somewhere. There is. I'm looking at the contents right now. <laughs> Here it is. Here it is on page 32. Okay. And this one, page 32. I, I was I was inspired by this. I was I was out walking, and. I've been looking at uh, I've been looking at uh, a production of Macbeth as well, and the mm. two things will come together. Okay. Because there's a, a scene in Macbeth early on when the witches are around the cauldron, getting the brew going, and yes. they're, they're double double boiling exactly, <laughs> chanting all this foulness. Yes. So I said, you know what? Here's the antidote. So here we go. Incantation. Breath of air. A summer breeze, scent of blossom in the trees. Smile of stranger, laugh of child, white caps on the ocean wild. Hand of friendship, touch of care, worn and favored easy chair. Crystal mornings, sunny dawn, dewdrops shining on the lawn. Gentle kisses, lovers smile, sandy beaches off the aisle, busy kitchens, voices loud. Peaceful walks far from the crowd. Evening rain, thunder roll, July mare with newborn foal. Blessings dance beneath the skies. Light the fire behind your eyes. So thanks for requesting that, Hugh. That was beautiful. Well, thank you. Yeah. Hey, good luck with your next book. Thanks very much. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna ask maybe. I think I'll ask a few questions too. Uh, how, you know, this was, like I said, it was with me for a while. But how long did it take you to write all of these poems? Like when a long start? time, uh, because um, I'm not that organized. So I'll have a germ of an idea and sit on it for a week or two. Then I'll actually get active and work <laughs> and pages of crossings out and crumpled sheets later, I may have a draft. So it's a, pro it's a long process, Terry Lee. Yeah. Um, and it's not something I work at like a job. Um, I should, I don't, um, but I really enjoy the process. And when I'm into it, I'm, I'm into it and I'll work hard for a while. So it's, it takes me a while to accumulate things. Yeah, there, I mean, there's quite a few of them. And I thought, you know, it, although Hugh says they, it seems like you know you, you do it easily it always is a lot harder than people imagine you know so mm -hmm. how long would it have taken you to write each of those poems i mean oh. just have an idea of that like yeah i mean i, I don't know uh, a week more i mean i uh for instance um let's just think of a poem that has as its subject uh the image of a crow. Well, I, I, for that, I, I researched crows. So I know way more about crows than I ever need to know or that I know for that poem. So there's that part of it. And then there's the putting the thing together, changing the ideas, getting the meter right. So it's, it's, it's a process. Uh, and I enjoy the process. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's also a learning process. Learning as you write. You know, yes. On, on each topic. And it, there's a real 
knack to that, you know, to be able to take this topic that's sort of quite a big topic, like for example, crows or whatever it is, um, and just sort of like do all that research around it and then put it into this small little poem. Yeah, you have to distill things. You have to get the, get the, get to the essence, the essence of the, the feeling you're trying to impart and the essence of the imagery you're using to get there as well. So it's, yeah, it's a distillation process. And it's a real art, you know, I mean, I think to make that, to make it look easy, but it's not, you know, I mean. Well, I'm, glad it, I'm glad it looks easy. <laughs> When 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 he was saying that, he knows it too. But you know, it's yeah. it's a lot of work to sort of take these big topics and uh, and you know make it so evocative and just using the right word at the right time. Which was your favorite one? Oh, good heavens! That's very hard because there's such a such a variety, and there's a variety because I love a variety of poems myself. Um, I like variety in life, whether it's food, drink, activities, whatever. Um, so there's such a variety. It's hard to compare a, a sonnet with a more free form or a, a trio lettera, a villanelle. They're all so different. However, to answer your question, I'm rather partial to the, the opening poem in the book, um, The River, because I look out of my window every day and I see that. Uh, I'm getting a thumbs up there from Bob. That's great. Thanks, Bob. And uh, so I really enjoy that. I mean, this morning I, we walked by the river before the rain began on this dreary December morning. So that's uh, that's probably one of my favorites. How did you decide which ones? I mean, you, you must have a, a whole pile more. Yes, I, I, I do. Um, how do I decide what goes into the collection? Um, shuffle them up and deal them out. No. Um, I, I put the collection together quite carefully. The order of the poems is, is deliberate and thoughtfully done, and they just seem to fit together. So it's not scientific, but it feels right. Yeah, and you, there were some that you had in there originally that you and Hugh decided to mix it up. And take it out there, there was one. There, there was one I took out and uh, put put another one in again. They, it seemed to, to have the right feel for this collection. I was going at the, I remembered it from the first submission and then it wasn't, in, I was like, okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> that'll, be, that'll be in the next one. Maybe, actually, the one, the one that didn't make it to this collection was St. Patrick's Day. And I, so I, I already had it envisioned how it would look on the page and everything. <laughs> Well, you're you're going to be breaking Irish hearts. <laughs> I know. You know. Maybe we'll maybe we'll do a, a holiday collection. Yes. And that'll feature prominently. That'd be great. Yeah. But wis the wisdom of the wood came in place of that, and I like I like the way it came off the bench. It did a good job, so I'm happy with that change. And you seem to get a lot of inspiration just from the nature around you. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Is that you know? You spend a lot of time in nature. Is that um, more so than maybe somebody else? Or you mentioned. I, I don't fire. know. I've, I've always enjoyed the outdoors, Terry Lee. Uh, not only do I enjoy the outdoors, I, li I also enjoy uh, other poets who have been similarly inspired. Um, uh, someone I've been reading lately is uh, Felix Dennis, English poet who died about 10 years ago, maybe, maybe not quite. But uh, his, uh, a lot of his stuff, not all of his stuff, but a lot of his stuff resonates with me because he's, he bases it with images from the natural world. So but yeah, I enjoy, I enjoy nature. I'm, I'm, we're out every day. I, I pictured you being out all the time when I was reading them. I was like, you must oh, good. a lot of time outside. And... Yeah. When, in, when in doubt, go out. <laughs> and it's not something that's you know you know there was a, a time I think there was a lot of poetry um you know set in nature but you don't see it I don't see it as much I don't get that many submissions um but it is a, you know I think now more than ever because of what's happening in, you know with COVID and everything that it's it's a time to sort of appreciate stop take take a moment appreciate what's around us and I hope so 
So, um, I don't think I have any more questions. Um, maybe we should, did you want to do a little poetry reading now and then open it up for other people? Sure, let's do that. Let's do that. I, have, I hadn't done any ahead of time. I hadn't picked any out just in case there were requests coming through. But you, you know what, let's, um, since it's a dreary November day here, let's, uh, well, it's a November day in December. I was going to say, I think yeah, it's December it's, now. It's warm, <laughs> it's, warm, it's warm enough for November. Okay, let's, let's go to the beach. And, and Hugh mentioned this title, Holy of Holies, Sanctum Sanctorum. So you've got to get away from the gloom and grayness of today. And here we go to the beach. Your beach wrap flutters in the air. Its hem is tinged with salty spray. The sun has met us here again, all the way from yesterday. Your sunscreen leaves a soft, deep sheen. It glistens like so many jewels, while wavelets whisper to the shore and scatter through the sandy pools. You kick your shoes into the sand, then stretch your legs out from your chair. Grains flow and tumble through your toes. You sit back, happy, unaware. You're bathed in sunlight, lulled by waves. Your mind is calm, you're out of reach. I'd be a fool to break this spell, disturb the sanctum of the beach. Now evening breezes stir the grass. The summer sun will soon sink low. Our mood will shift just like the sand and we will pack our things and go. But then I will remember where your beach wrap fluttered in the air. So if that didn't warm you up, I don't know. And, and that, that's, that's beautiful. And you also, you also have a wonderful reading voice. Oh, thank you. You do. You should, you should do some readings, some more readings. I hope to. Yes. I hope good, to. Good. If we ever get to go in person again, you know, that would be yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I miss those open mics. Yeah. <laughs> well, how about we also celebrate the fact that it is a gloomy gray day. And this one is one of the first I ever seriously wrote. And uh, I'll just read it. Uh, the Rossiter Park, for those in uh, Zoom land, uh, is the park, the village park that is just outside my front window and beyond it, the river. So this is called Rossiter Park, November. A goldfinch flits from bough to bough, flowers flamed, now rose hips wane. His once bright coat is faded now, summer the sun left autumn rain. We sat there then and watched the stream. Silently, we watched the tides. Cars on the bridge flowed east and west. Nought we cherished now abides. I sit now in the north wind's chill. Trees wear yellow rags of time. The mottled finch is singing still. Hissing reeds attend his rhyme. Dead leaves float eddy dart and turn. Pontoon docks are hauled ashore. Our haunted souls recall and yearn, hoping for our spring once more. So a little Celtic melancholy infusing in that one, I think. Yes, I think that's very nice. I think I should mention here, just in case, if there's anybody who's watching or listening uh, who didn't hear Matt Rainey's interview with you, was that yesterday? Yeah, it was, it was aired on Wednesday, but it's, uh, it's recorded on CBC podcast. Yeah, and it's in the podcast and it's amazing. You did a great job and he asked you the most wonderful questions. It was a good interview. So I, th I thought it was wonderful, yeah. Mm -hmm. So everybody should hear it. It's posted on the Acorn um, Facebook page. Okay. Oh, okay, good. Acorn Press Facebook page, okay. Yeah. It's amazing what uh, what great radio editing can do. The six and a half minutes, it sounds really good. 
Any requests? What have we got here? Something for Christmas. Christmas? Okay. Let's do, let's do the one I did on my radio interview. I really like this. Page 17. It is. They won't have the book yet. No. The, uh, for, the, for the English scholars out there, and I know you're listening, uh, the verses of this are in triolet form. So, of course, I called it Christmas triolet. I hear the frozen river crack and smell the smoke from wood stove fires. A sweet sound rings from Christmas choirs. I hear the frozen river crack. I hear the tale of wise men three and decorate the Christmas tree. I hear the frozen river crack and smell the smoke from wood stove fires. My footsteps scuff the dusting snow. I watch a star high up above. The season touches us with love. My footsteps scuff the dusting snow. I see the hungry blue jay feed and gifts unwrapped with eager speed. My footsteps scuff the dusting snow. I watch a star high up above. Just now the houses dance with light. I see the TVs glow within and soon the reruns will begin. Just now the houses dance with light and visions of our bygone days remembered through a mulled wine haze. Just now the houses dance with light. I see the TVs glow within. The evening air is breathless calm. I feel the peace that Christmas brings when children dance and Crosby sings. The evening air is breathless calm. The season weaves a magic spell enchanted by the Christmas bell. The evening air is breathless calm. I feel the peace that Christmas brings. And there's a lovely illustration of a Christmas tree at the, at the bottom of that poem. It rounds it off perfectly. We have a request from Bob for okay. the river. For the That's river, awesome. coming up. Coming up, the show opener. Here we go, Bob the river. What awaits past the river bend? What do we find today, my friend? Water pebbled by the western breeze. A blue jay shrieks in the poplar trees. The, book the brook trout lies in the cool, dark deep. The eagle glides on her broad wing sweep. A fisherman crouches on a rusty stool. A kingfisher's plunge, a concentric jewel. The child in the kayak has laughing eyes. Cirrus clouds paint the vaulted skies. Banks rise high with forest green. Black ducks dabble, bob and preen. The paddles drip, the rushes sway. Last rays of sunlight fade away. Home awaits past the river bend. Guide the craft with me, my friend. As we float on the stream of sleep, the night wind stirs the leaves to quiver. Aspen trembles, willows weep, while onward passes time and river. Beautiful. Thank you. I think we'll let people ask questions now too. I think it might be- um, Sure, that'll be fun. Sort of open it up. People wanna know about the process or and you can put your questions in the chat and I can read them out or you can unmute yourself and put your video on, totally up to you. I, I, hi, hi Robert. Yeah. not so much, um, just to give everybody a little bit of a background. I've known Rod for a long time through my brother who is a good friend of Rod's. And um, I always knew that you were uh, deep, person and I had not heard any of your poems this is the very first time I've heard you read your poetry and I'm actually my brother's actually getting 
your book for me for Christmas too. But I, um, I have some, you know, I dabble in poetry myself, but Rod, I, I just, I can't like, I, the poems that you have just read, the imagery that's in that and the depth that's in that. Like I have the, I, I, the cracking of the ice, I'm thinking of that, the hissing of the reeds, like all these things that are just like very, like when you're talking about your variety, it's all coming out in an individualistic poem. Like the, the okay. right, right from the, you know, from the ocean and you're bringing so many elements like time, death, um, you know, um, nature, um, the fact that you don't like the stillness of you not wanting that memory of the floating bath, um, uh, not um, the, um, on the beach, the, uh, the wrap, like I can just, right, yeah. I can just see that in the, in the, in oh, the air. Well, thank you. And, then, and you're just like, okay, I don't want to not remember this, right? I mm -hmm. just want to be able to do that. And to bring that in, like, it's, you're very, very gifted. Like it's, well, thank you. it's extremely, uh, the imagery, like I can have it, each one I can do, the, I can th see the river. I love the first one that you read about the fire in the eyes, like in the, the way that you're ending, it's just like, it just brings it all. Uh, it's a real mastery, right? Like it's- Well, thank you, you're very kind, sir. You know, very, um, and I'm so glad that I was able to hear that, uh, to hear this today and, um, um yeah really keep keep writing and, and i know oh, yes. i know you will but but it's a I, I can't wait to get the the book for christmas thank you i just had to comment yeah thank you okay perhaps you could read wisdom of the wood sure and there's a, a few things could, could you see the the requests that were popping up on the screen the same way i could yeah i can read those out first okay so we'll so we'll do uh if you yeah. can make a note of those genevieve i'll get to them yeah yeah, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Hugh wants wisdom of the wood there. Sure. There we go, 24. Yes, I really like this one as well. Wisdom of the wood. A lot of wisdom in it. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. If we but ask, Hugh, if we but ask. Here we go. <laughs> wisdom of the wood. If we ask, the trees will know and share the wisdom of the wood. If we ask how to stand the axes blow, how roots dig deep and branches grow, how to live just as we should, if we ask. If we look, we might see questions answered in the glade. If we look, why saplings must grow free, why knowledge hangs upon a tree, why we need the sacred shade, if we look. If we listen, we may hear whispered comfort in the leaves, if we listen. Where dew hangs like a dropping tear, where the singing wind is ever near, where plays the tune that nature weaves, if we listen. Lovely. What are some of those requests, Genevieve? Yeah, so first, um, Vincent was wondering about the cover of your book and if you have uh, uh, Yeah, Vincent, hi, Vincent. The, uh, the, the cover is uh, a line drawing done by the designer oh. whose oh. name is Matt Reed. So the, the illust cover illustration is a, a, a drawing done by Matt Reed based on a photograph that I took of the St. Peter's Harbour Lighthouse. Can you hold it up so people can see it? Yes, of course. So there we are. That is the St. Peter's Harbor Lighthouse, which is on the Lighthouse Beach, down the Lighthouse Road. And it is next, just next door to Paradise, if you're ever looking for it. Karen was wondering if, is there a poem about the lighthouse or? Absolutely. Yeah. Lighthouse, St. Peter's Harbour Lighthouse. Mm -hmm. Here it is, 42. So this is in sonnet form. There are three sonnets in the book. Uh, I really enjoy the musicality of the sonnet. Uh, I'm from the county of Warwickshire in, in England and about just over 400 years ago, there was some guy who was not a bad sonneteer, can't quite 
uh, William somebody, uh, but I read some of his stuff for inspiration. Um, Shake staff or something. Um, anyway, St. Peter's Harbor Lighthouse in sonnet form. Frail timber bones do rot with salty spray. A clinging darkness falls where once shone light. Does aged skin of shingle fade to gray? Time's arrows sting and wind-blown sand grains bite. The harbor is an echo of the past. Boats now content at Redhead Wharf to tie. No schooner's lockout, uh, lookout climbs a lofty mast. Consigned, your tower seems, to rot and die. But Pharos beacon never did resound with laughing sounds so joyful and alive. Folks seeking sun and solace now abound as down the rutted lane the people drive. St. Peter's Harbor light, endure and stand, where mermaids lie on beach towels in the sand. So there, the lighthouse, now resurrected by the St. Peter's Harbor Lighthouse Society. New coat of paint, beautiful job. So, so Rod had, had submitted a, a picture uh, that he took of the lighthouse, which was a, a beautiful picture and was um, suggesting it for, for a cover image, which was would have been a great cover image. I totally had nothing wrong with it. But um, again, it didn't to me, it didn't really harken back to that kind of a quieter time, a gentler time in the same way uh, that I was kind of thinking about. So that's when I asked the designer to take that image and just you know, draw, do a sketch of the lighthouse and, and uh, yeah, I hope I hope everybody likes it. Yeah, the line draw, the line drawing is great, and and the, and the and the small illustrations throughout the book are yeah. really complimentary. I like them. Yeah, Matt Matt did little drawings to go with the poems as well. So, um, what else do you have? Rod there? Is wondering if you have a song in mind when you're writing, because he can't he can't help he or she can't help hear a song when you read your Chris when you read your Christmas poem. Um. Well, they're, they're certainly lyrical. I don't know whether I have a song in mind. I listen to songs. I draw inspiration from songs. I like lyrically dense songs. Um, so it'd be, it'd, be fun to, it'd be fun to work as a lyricist and, uh, and put words and music together, I think. So yeah, I, you know, I, I enjoy popular. I like singer songwriters. Just been listening a lot to uh, American chap who was popular in the 70s and early 80s, uh, Steve Forbert, who uh, really does a, in, in, inspires me in, a, in some things that I do. So he's one of the people I listen to. But yeah, good, good comment, uh, Jared, yeah. And um, another question about what would your advice be for a budding poet? Uh, this is gonna sound simplistic, but do it. Um, just write words. For every good word I, I write, if I have any good words, I've written a hundred ones that do not suit. So just put it down and then edit. Just edit like crazy. Um, but just, just write. Uh, don't be frightened. Um, I, when I started writing seriously about five years ago, I entered a contest. Uh, 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 the the poetry contest on Prince Edward Island. I was fortunate enough to get uh, a second place in it, or first runner up, as we could say. And uh, that's something else I think as well. If, if there are contests, enter them. If there are open mics, go to them and perform. It helps re uh, refine the skills of writing and reading. Thank you. Mike, you might have some advice too. He was a very established poet. Oh, know, absolutely, yeah. Many, many poetry books under his belt. Did you have any other tips, Hugh? But, uh, uh, I think, I think what, uh, what Rod said is true. If you want to write, uh, write. Just sit down and do it. And first of all, um, write for yourself and, or for your family or if you have anybody who will actually read it. You know, gather together some readers and uh, 
maybe send stuff to them and see what they think. And if they tell you something isn't probably really good, maybe don't yell at them or anything, but just <laughs> listen, learn to listen and learn to take advice. And the other thing, my father was a, was a school inspector and he used to visit rural schools. And he used to just say two things you have to do. You have to learn how to write, but mostly you have to read. Yeah, and oh, you yeah. read a lot. You yeah. read if there's something you read that you really like, then maybe try to write something in that kind of a style or in that way. Yeah. Uh, the more you read, the better you'll write. I agree. The more you'll read, the more you'll know. <laughs> that's, that's. I think Dr. Easy. Zeus said that. Dr. Zeus, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know. Listen to Dr. Zeus. Yeah. <laughs> and that and that tip that was the sort of there early on about doing the research too, right? Yeah, sure. Yes, yeah. Don't write about it if you don't know what know about it. Yeah. And be patient. Quest for um, the nest. Okay. The nest. The nest, the nest, there we are, 23. And that's from Suzanne. Suzanne, my pleasure, Suzanne, to do this. It's. Uh, Direct observation. I was walking, uh, walking down in the back field by the cottage, and there it was. Uh, it, it was late in the year. Everything was windswept and blown away, and there was this tiny nest, just hanging there. The nest. I saw your nest while working, frail on an aspen tree, enduring yet abandoned, a woven filigree. The grass that you had gathered and placed in flowing rills has stood the test of winter storms, a credit to your skills. You're driven by instinct and passion. I build with tools and plans. Your thoughts are of the present, so different from man's. We know inexorable time will cause our works decay. We know nothing lasts forever. I'm fool to hope it may. You will build again this springtime, as you are wont to do. And I wonder, fellow builder, who's craftsman, me or you? The nest. Sort of almost timely. <laughs> so good. We'll build again. <laughs> There will be other seasons. Yes. I'm not sure what Anyone else. Have questions. Terry Monahan said, "Little Stevie." I'm not sure what that means. Oh, little Stevie. <laughs> Terry, Terry, my old friend and English scholar, is uh, referring to uh, an album by uh, Steve Forbert, which we shared back in our college days. It's called "Little Stevie Orbit." So yes, and I recommend you. Everyone should listen to it. Everyone should listen to Steve Forbert. I'm not being paid to say this. <laughs> Any other questions out there or comments from the from our audience? People can feel free to, you know, turn off their mics and speak up if there's anything they want to say. Or... Oh yeah. Hi, it's Bob here in uh, New Forest in the UK. Hey Bob. Hi, um, I, I really think it's a great ambition, really well fulfilled, Rod. It's a great collection. Thanks, man. And as you know, I like the river because that's one of the things we did when I first came to see you is to canoe up the river until we got to the Beaver Dam. That's that's right, really? my old canoeing friend there, yeah, the, the Bowman. Yeah. 1999. <laughs> <laughs> so a little while ago, but that's not as, not as long. I've known Rod about 45 years, something like that. Oh, yes, good that's heavens. Cool 70, 71. Yeah, well, more than that. Blimey, Craig Mulder, I thought I was. Yeah, it's, where did that? Ha how did that happen? I don't know. It's weird, isn't it? But I, I, mm. you, you always was a philosopher in his teenage years. <laughs> Weren't so, we all? <laughs> <laughs> many, many hours spent um, having a few beers in the Half Moon, which was a pub in rugby, and then we go back to Rod's place and listen to Bob Dylan and <laughs> World War Three Blues. So there's some of the inspiration buried deep in the background, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. Thank you, right. I mean, Rod's got great, great lines. I always remember he said that uh, life was like a pint of Ruddles, which was a beer 
that's a real ale beer brewed in the Midlands because it was dark and mysterious with cruddy bits that floated below the surface. <laughs> <laughs> I never forgot that. Well remembered. Oh dear. Yes. Yeah. We only got in the half moon because we were sort of not old enough to drink at that stage. But that never, uh, sto that never stopped us. Yeah, that's right. And the publican Merv was good enough to let us do it because he knew we'd keep ourselves to ourselves round the corner out of view. Yeah, and we used to sit close to the door in case we were kicked out. It was less far to go. Right. <laughs> yeah, great days. Great yeah, days. It was. They're nice to see the squirrel still there. I was in rugby on Sunday and the squirrel is still there. That's one of the smallest pubs in town where if three of you are in there, that was it. It was full. Yeah, you know what? When this when this pandemonium is over, we'll have to get back and get in one of those establishments. Absolutely. There are fewer and fewer left these days. They're all going, sadly. Yeah, alas. Alas. It's good to hear your voice. Yeah, you too. It's been a while. It has. But what, what makes Rod so sort of special, really, is that um, a few years back when the London bombs went off, I was working in London, and he knew that. And he actually rang up to, to see if I was OK. And that's really sort of the special moments, you know. Yeah, we've got to, got to look after each other. Was right. in, was in, we're in the days where it's really expensive to make those calls too, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, no tinternet then. <laughs> exactly. Like it. Hello. Hello, Rod. Your buddy, hey, Brian. How's it, how's it going? Good, good. Uh, question I have, you know, you and I have been around for a while competing in bike races and and being part of the relays and getting into those moments where there's a lot of stress and, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're racing very competitive. Uh -huh. Have you ever thought about making poems, especially when you and I, you're my nemesis and we're racing and trying to duel each other and uh, and what was going through your mind during those? Actually, Brian, I've, I've, started, a, I've started a poem about uh, about uh, you trying to beat me is it's, it's called rear view mirror oh okay <laughs> I, knew, I knew that would uh i knew that would, uh, <laughs> I knew that would interest you uh so uh yeah but i just thought that you know i know there's lots you know, of guys anticipating what? race and yeah, what you know you know what though thank you for thank you for reminding me about this the cycling part because for you right now, I think I'd like to read Cycling on the Beach. How about that? Okay. I'll do that, bud. Okay. Cycling on the Beach. Here somewhere. Cycling on the Beach. Here it is, Cycling on the Beach. So uh, I, own a, I own a fat bike, which for the non-cycling People is a bike with really big tires, and it hardly leaves a hardly leaves a mark in nature. I love cycling on the beach. Cycling on the beach, fifty six. Cycling on the beach. I'm cycling on the beach, out of reach, alone, no phone, unplanned, on the sand, breathing air without care. Tires hiss, nothing amiss, where I find bliss. Barely a sound but the sea whispering, merely a thought that I'm following. Cloudlets above, tracks beneath. Nothing to show, nothing worth knowing. Nowhere to go, that's where I'm going. Pedals spin, I grin. Diamond sea and me, we're free. Yeah, cycling on the beach. Good. Great place to be. Good, good one. Good one, Rod. Thanks. There was another. There was another uh, question in the comments. Would you happen to have a, a poem inspired by the love of fly fishing? Alan is asking. Uh, I, I I don't. I should. I don't. I have my fishing kind of a fishing poem I'll share, uh, which is called Bill which is kind of a bit of a ballad -y thing, which is a nice change, change of pace. But I do love fly fishing. I love all kinds of fishing. Uh, fly fishing is, is uh, very enjoyable. So Bill 33. So this is 
about a fellow who may or may not ex exist or have existed? Bill, by the river every morning, sitting on the mossy bank, Bill fished, motionless and quiet, breathing air, musty and dank. On the laneway every noontime, trudging homeward without care, with fishing rod and empty bucket, jacket, stain, and fin with wear. Villagers would call out to him, hey Bill, what'd you catch today? He just smiled and replied slowly, every last one got away. Yet he sat there every morning, gray eyes fixed as if entranced, while his line lay in the water, nature all around him danced. Brook trout flashed in dappled shadows, poplar branches cracked the sky, squirrels scampered through the bushes, eagles looked down from on high. Bright marigolds, shining yellow, matched the goldfinch with their show, while across the woods and marshes rang the hoarse cry of the crow. Skeins of geese with raucous honking, silent, deadly osprey dive, bullfrogs with their basso chatter brought the swampy fields alive. Though he knew no wife nor children, though he called no man his friend, Bill felt all creation near him. Peace upon him did descend. By the river, one spring morning, dead beside the mossy brook, when they reeled his line in for him, they found that it bore no hook. That's Bill. <clears throat> well, on that note. <laughs> ah, hey, hey, buddy. Um, I think we could probably uh, turn off the recording now and then you can kind of have a little chat with your friends if that